Okay, so if you recall from section 2.9, uh, we defined the reflection coefficient to be the ratio of the uh, reflected vol voltage wave with the um, reflected voltage voltage wave wave with the um, incident voltage wave. We started off with the solution to the w voltage wave equation. It looks something like this. Um, we make this substitution for the reflection coefficient. We ended up uh, previously with this equation for the um, impedance. So if we use this equation and do a little bit of manip manipulation, so here we factor out this exponential term. Um, they kind of cancel out. Um, we assume that the lines are lossless again. So the um, the propagation constant simplifies a little bit, and we end up with the uh, with beta. So I didn't meant to mention this in the last lecture, but oftentimes the propagation constant is written like this. For the situation where the lines are lossless, um, RNG both equal zero, this alpha term fades away. Uh, that defines the attenuation, and then we end up with uh, with this beta term here. So 2 pi over, over lambda is beta. Um, so we end up with um, the equation for the input impedance uh, kind of in a different form here. So this is where we define the reflection coefficient to be, um, you know, the, the the load reflection coefficient multiplied by uh, this exponential. And we'll see how this is useful here in a minute. I mentioned uh, rotations along the Smith chart, and that's that's where it comes from. But what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to explain to you where the curves that you see on the Smith chart come from. Okay, so if we if we let the impedance, you know, equal a real and an imaginary part, and we let the, um, the reflection coefficient equal a real and imaginary part, then we can rewrite the equation for the um, impedance like this, where the real part is given by um, this expression here, and the imaginary part is given by this expression here. What you see here is, is uh, like I said, we're dealing with complex numbers. Um, this is a complex mapping uh, from the z plane to the reflection coefficient plane. Okay, so that's that's what's happening here. So here we have the z plane. So these are all complex numbers. You know, every point on on the z plane is a complex number with a magnitude and an angle. Um, points on the z plane get mapped to points on the reflection coefficient plane using these mappings that we see here. Okay, so the vertical lines that correspond to the real part of the um, impedance get mapped to these circles. Okay, so that's why these circles are called, you know, circles of constant resistance, because along this line the resist the uh, the resistance is constant, so in this case it's three. So on this circle here, uh, resistance equals three. That's the constant resistance circle. Okay, this circle gets mapped, or this line gets mapped to this circle. I mentioned the circle, or the the curves of constant reactance. Those are the this would be a line of constant reactance in the z plane, and it gets mapped to uh, the curves of constant reactance on the um, on the gamma plane, on the reflection coefficient plane. So one thing I wanted to point out that um, here, obviously, these are circles that are centered on the um, on the line where the uh, imaginary part of the reflection coefficient equals zero. Well, maybe maybe it's not as noticeable here, but these are also circles, okay, with a center point that's kind of like off of the um, of outside of kind of the the main circle where the reflection coefficient equals one. Okay, because like we saw before, the magnitude of the reflection coefficient is always uh, within this kind of uh, range here. What I mean by that is that the, the radius of the circle corresponds to the situation where the reflection coefficient equals 1, or the magnitude of the reflection coefficient equals 1. So where do these circles come from? So if we start off with the expression for the real part of this 
mapping here. So we, if we start off with this expression, and we do a little bit of manipulation, so we multiply both sides by uh, what's on the denominator here. Uh, we expand this side out, and then with this term here, we complete the square to end up with this guy here. Um, and then we uh, bring this guy over to the right-hand side of the equation. We end up with this expression here. And if we think in terms of the reflection coefficient plane, where we have the real part and the imaginary part, we can see here that this equation has you know, the real part and the imaginary part. And this corresponds to uh, the equation of a circle. Okay, so that's where that's where the uh, constant resistance circles come from. So this equation corresponds to um, the equation for a circle with the center on the um, horizontal axis in the uh, reflection coefficient plane. Uh, similarly, we can do it do the same thing um, with the other equation. So let me just go back to that to remind you what I'm talking about. So with this guy here. So we want to know where the where do the um, equations for circles come from uh, when we talk about mapping lines of constant uh, reactants. They come from this equation here. Uh, it's a similar derivation. I won't go through the process, but um, this is the equation that you end up with. And as you can see, um, in this equation we have the center uh, located on on the real axis. Um, with this guy here, we have the center that's um, off of the, that's outside of the, um, you know, the range where gamma is less than one. So I mentioned before the um, the intersection of the constant resistance circles with the constant reactant circles give us uh, impedances. So this shows us where or how um, points on the z plane get mapped to points on the uh, reflection coefficient plane and how the points on the z-plane correspond to you know the intersection of constant resistance and constant um, reactance uh, lines and then in the gamma plane that corresponds to circles where the constant resistance or sorry where the resistance and um, reactant circles intersect. Another thing too is that uh, this isn't important here, um, but this is called a conformal mapping in complex analysis because the angles um, in the z-plane, they are preserved. So here there's a 90 degree angle between uh, you know these two straight lines and then in the gamma plane, uh, if we zoom in on that point, we see that that angle is preserved. So that's known as a conformal mapping.